Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic is one of the most surprising statements ever in algebraic topology, or maybe actually in general topology in some sense. So it's not really an algebraic topology statement. It turns out to be very useful in algebraic topology, as we will see. And it arises trying to answer a natural question, but actually it's really a statement about the spaces itself, space itself. And it's kind of a really, really weird thing. It kind of tells you something about um, approximating uh, maps by certain cellular maps. And we'll see what that means. And what it really means in practice, and this is kind of very surprising, is that um, there will be space filling curves and you can kind of ignore them from the viewpoint of algebraic topology, which is um, in, in hindsight kind of obvious, but it was a huge problem in the beginnings of algebraic topology to the discovery of a lot of those space filling curves, this crazy fractal type curves. Um, and this is kind of saying you can basically ignore them. It's kind of a funny statement. So let's have a look. So um, the, the, the main question why I would like to address this now is um, it fits very well to the story of calculating pi case of SNs. Um, as I tried to say at one point, so um, if you want to calculate the pi, ends, uh, the pi case of the SNs, this is kind of hopeless and you just can't say anything. Turns out that kind of in the roughly half of the case, so it's not quite true, in half of the cases, whatever that means, you can actually say quite a lot. So if you like to take this picture into account that here's the pies, here's the pies, and here's the s's, and then roughly everything below the diagonal is kind of well known. And it's basically because of the following statement and theorem that you want to see. Um, so let's try to again calculate the fundamental groups of pi one. So the, the index here is always smaller than the dimension of the sphere. So pi one S2 is this illustration here. You put a loop in S2, like a belt, like the equator, and you, you realize that you can actually pull it, pull it away from the equator, just pull it over, pull it over, and shrink it at one point uh, to just one point. And the way to make this a little bit more precise is because, of course, for equator, you could do that, but you want to do that for any loop, is the strategy uh, which I call poking holes. So um, you just take your SN or S2 in my example here, you poke a hole somewhere, you flat it open. So if I poke a hole here, say uh, in my, well, in, in this illustration, it's probably better to poke it in the South Pole. So I poke it in the South Pole, uh, I get the sphere without the South Pole and I can flatten the sphere without the South Pole actually into a rectangle. And in a rectangle, it's pretty obvious that uh, my loop contracts. So that's kind of what I what is done here in this picture. So um, if you believe the strategy of poking a hole into the South Pole, uh, then flatten the space itself, and everything is flat, everything is a square, and in the square it's trivial, then this calculation of pi 1 of S2 is not so hard. The, so contract the rest along with the map. Uh, that's kind of the strategy. The catch here is, of course, that I kind of need to make sure, sure that all of my loops in this example, misses my South Pole, right? Because I want to poke a hole in there and I just don't want to poke straight through, uh, straight through a loop. That would be bad. So I, I need to push the loop a little bit away uh, from the South Pole and then I'm good. And I kind of poke my hole, pull, pull off the sphere and I'm, I'm good to go. I, can, I just proved that pi one of S2 uh, is trivial and then in general, we would prove that uh, pi K of Sn would be trivial as long as K is small enough. Sounds like a really good strategy. And actually, this is how you would do it. Um, it's just a slight catch that you need to make sure that everything kind of misses at least one point. Um, and, and that's not so obvious. Um, so let me show you uh, in, in a second the mathematical demonstration of a space filling curve. So it, it will spin out this picture here. Um, as you can almost see, this is kind of a square. Uh, there are a little bit white areas here, but it's kind of a, a square. Just, just as an area of a square. But this is not a square, it's just a curve. So it's really just an, a map from S1 as from 0, 1 into the square, so a uh, square. And it kind of fills out the squares, the space filling curve. And this is kind of a little bit of a, well, a bummer because we want to push those, this kind of a loop in disguise, right? So we just need to glue the ends. We want to push those um, maps away from a point, but they fill out the whole square. 
So we can't really, it's not so obvious why we can do that, right? Um, it will turn out that we can still do it, as I said, and there's a quite general statement that we can, we can do this in a, a, really a lot of generality, which is very surprising. Anyway, before we go there, let me show you a space filling curve. So here's an example, Mathematica linked in the description of a space filling curve. Um, as you can see, this is not quite space filling yet. And the point is all of these curves arise using iteration steps. So um, the curve itself is kind of the, the limit of the iteration. It's still a continuous map. So it completely fits into this framework that we have in mind, like looped in spaces, and it will fill out the space as you will see. So uh, after a certain number of iterations, you, get, you kind of get the pattern, right? You start here, you iterate that in a certain way. Now you get this kind of whatever it is type pattern, you iterate it a little bit more. It's kind of a pattern inside of itself. It's this fractal type idea. And you iterate it a little bit more and it's almost completely filling the space. And you can kind of believe, and this is actually true, so you could prove it, that if you increase the iteration more and more, so from here to here to two to three, and this is where it stops because it's not so easy to compute. Um, so the next step would already kind of compute for a while. Um, anyway, if you, if you push this to infinity, you get your space filling curve. You get a map from zero, one into the square, which kind of fills, which hits every point of the square. And this is, of course, kind of bad because we kind of want to push everything away from at least one point. So it's not so obvious why you should be able to do this, keeping in mind that you can have really crazy curves, right? The problem is, as usual, um, our, our brain, or at least my brain, can't imagine how crazy a curve actually can be. And we are now talking even about a uh, pi k of Sn, so a higher dimensional version of this problem, and ooh, God knows what happens. This would be my feeling. Uh, just a priori, but it turns out that there's a really nice answer, beautiful answer, uh, very surprising in my opinion. So here comes a funny example, which is kind of a blueprint example of what happens. So here's a torus, of course, this is a torus, but it's not just the torus, it's a torus with a fixed cell structure, kind of the usual cell structure given by this loop B, it goes around a little bit like this, this loop A, it goes a little bit like this, and you, you glue in uh, the, the, the disk here, uh, D2 in to, to, to make the surface of, um, of the torus. And of course, this has a zero skeleton, a one skeleton, the one skeleton is just uh, the point. Uh, so everything one dimensional, the point and the two loops. So I just write a point A and B, so A and B and point. So this is the one skeleton and the two skeleton is then the whole, whole torus. And the observation now is, it's very, very easy, and we've all seen that before. And it's very strange that this actually generalizes in, in an absolutely beautiful way. So the observation is that most maps from S1 into T are certainly not contained in the one skeleton. So here's a map from S1 into T, which is certainly anything but connected in the one skeleton. So it goes around like this. It just goes, goes around some, something like crazy. It's an S1 in my torus, and it just goes around like crazy. Certainly most maps will not be contained in the one skeleton. It's slightly different. I'm not saying they miss the one skeleton, um, but they will certainly not be contained in the one skeleton, right? They're just far away from the one skeleton. Um, but it turns out that all maps are of course homotopic to uh, either a point, right? So this would, would happen, for example, if you would have a, an S1 that sits in like, like this, or to something in the one skeleton. So that's what I mean by, by writing this. So something in the one skeleton. All maps are homotopic to something that sits completely in the one skeleton. Most maps don't sit in the one skeleton, but all S1s kind of in the end are homotopic to something that sits in the one skeleton. And yeah, that's almost, uh, that basically is a statement. So here comes crazy uh, cellular approximation statement. So a map between cell complexes. So you choose your cell complex, which means you also choose your cell structure. And a map between them, so X and Y, is called cellular if the K skeleton always ends up in the K skeleton for all K. Uh, in this example, so here was a torus uh, with zero skeleton, one skeleton, and two skeleton. And I was interested in maps from S1 into T. And S1, of course, of course only has a zero skeleton and one skeleton. And all I said is that the one skeleton can be homotopped homotopy uh, 
made homotopy equivalent such that it ends completely in the one skeleton of the torus, although most maps were missing. And this is now exactly the statement. Every map between cell complexes is homotopic to a cellular map. So for a cell complexes, you can assume that every map between them actually preserves cells in a very, very strict way, which is mind blowing, okay? So it really just, it, 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 exactly this picture, uh, just in extreme generality for any cell complex of any dimension and anything. It's just extremely crazy, beautiful thing. So this is really, really beautiful. This, this is awesome. Awesome and very important statement in uh, topology. Really, this works for any choice of cell structure. So, if you would use this cell structure of the torus, you could do the same. So, uh, and the one skeleton is this piece here. So, this would be the T1 skeleton. It looks different from the other one, but you can still homotop your S1s such that they are completely contained in the one skeleton. Amazing statement. Works in any dimension. And right, and now we are done, right? So, we were trying to ask, uh, answer this problem of computing. The pi ends of the uh, the pi case of the s ends for small enough, and what you do is you just choose uh, for s n the cell structure of the zero skeleton and the n skeleton, and s k you can do whatever you want. You can do a zero skeleton with the k skeleton, and the statement is because this kind of stabilizes as always. This kind of stabilizes from k onwards. Is this this whole k skeleton? It can't go into the n cell. That's too big. So it needs to be contained in the K cell of Sn, and the K cell of Sn is still zero because it just doesn't, doesn't change uh, from zero up to the point of N. So this is really saying that we can assume that my whole sphere up to homotopy actually ends in the zero skeleton. So it, it definitely misses a point. It just ends in this corresponding zero skeleton. So we can really assume up to homotopy that my map ends in the case skeleton of Sn, but the case skeleton is trivial for Sn. This is kind of this missing point picture and then pulling it open. And yeah, we're done because now we just proved using the cellular approximation that um, all SKs in Sn are trivial because their case skeleton has to end up in the end up to homotopy completely in the case skeleton. Bonkers, really crazy statement. Okay, so let me wrap up. I think this cellular approximation is mind blowing. It tells you that cell complexes are extremely nice objects. It's not like they're nice as, as uh, spaces, but also the morphisms between them are extremely nice. So you can always homotop a map between cell complexes in such a way that it's cellular in the sense that uh, this case skeleton goes into the case skeleton for all K. Works for all choices of cell structures, works for all maps between them, a crazily general and beautiful state. I really like it. I ho hope you like it as well. And I also, also, of course, hope you like the video and I also hope to see you next time.